Welcome to Life by Randy and LBR's community. The LBR community is a group of seekers, those that seek wisdom above all, seek information and knowledge, and actually get inspired by looking at life just a little bit differently than the popular paradigms and narratives. And we are a community that is open, loving, and curious. That's why we have on today an amazing man that I have just met recently, but he's certainly familiar around the country. He is a farmer. He is not just a farmer, though. He's an entrepreneur. He's an author. He's a TV personality. He's a frequent guest on The Rachel Ray Show. He is a visionary. And he is my new friend and guest on Life by Randy. Welcome, Farmer Lee Jones. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, you know, the introduction is amazing. I, you give me way too much credit. Um, it's a team effort here. It's a family and it's an extended family. But we, we do all things through the glory of God and we give God all the grace. Um, um, we're just a vessel. Wow. for this. So the land, we don't own the land. We're tenants of the land. We just feel it's very blessed to have the privilege of getting to work and tend the land. So you've given me way too much credit. I, I'm i the one receiving blessings by being able to be here today with you and to be able to do what we love. Oh, Farmer Jones, that's beautiful. That's wonderful. And you have, you and your family have a lot of land in Northern Ohio, and here on Ohio specifically, in the 419 area code where I just happened to move in October and I knew there were divine reasons for me to do so. And meeting you and teaming up with you is one of them. And so you are generational farming. You are a generational farming family on the shores of Lake Erie. Can you tell us about, about your family? Well, absolutely. Uh we're in an, in an amazing microclimate here right along Lake Erie. And uh, the soil that we're on is all old lake bottom about 11,000 years ago. It uh, had European settlers recognize this area as a terrific growing area. Uh, it was huge in wine grapes, even before vegetable, but it peaked with as near as we can figure the largest concentration of vegetable growers of any county in the world with 330 vegetable growers. Now, you can say, wait a minute, there are counties in California that are 100% agriculture from the north to the south to the east to the west. And it's true, but it's by 50 growers that each have 30,000 acres. You said we have a lot of land. We really don't. We're, we're kind of like the flea on the end of the tail on the end of the dog. We have over 40 years tried to piece together um, a, a small amount of acreage. We have 400 acres now. We're surrounded by farms that are farming three to 5,000 acres, some of them eight to 10,000 acres. So we really are small and we're okay with that. Um, it's never been about the size of the farm, but it is a truly amazing microclimate here that can grow. We have the attitude we can grow almost anything here. Um, and yeah. it, it, it's really a, a, a very rich sandy loam that we're growing on. And so your father was, he raised a farmer? My father, um, there's, there's a long line of agriculture in our family, but my grandfather died at 49 uh, and he was not farming. Um, I never met him. He died of cancer six months before I was born. And uh, my father started out, I just ran across an ad where in high school he was advertising in the local newspaper to plow people's gardens. And I think it was $5 to plow the garden. Uh, but uh, he started with nothing. And, you know, he went to work for a vegetable grower, a very progressive vegetable grower, when he was 14, learned a lot from him. His name was Charles Nichols, and ended up buying Charles Nichols farm, my mom and dad bought that farm. They, uh, Met the, my mother and father met in the seventh grade and dad, mom wouldn't let dad take her out till the 11th grade. And of course they were married by the time they were 19 and 20 and a year later had me. 
my mother, my mother apologizes. She's like, I'm so sorry you turned out the way you did. We were kids raising kids. We didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> At the time we had the second and third, we were figuring it out a little bit. But I feel like I kind of grew up with them. But, but in the early 80s, it's hard to imagine we've had a historic run of low interest rates, which we're finally starting to see come up a little bit. Um, but they hit 22% in the late 70s, early 80s. And traditional, with a lot of um, agricultural operations, you would borrow your operating capital in the winter. You would invest that in seeds and in fertilizer and in containers and fuel and labor and all the things you needed. And then as the crops started to come in, you would repay those loans. Hopefully there was something left at the end and you reinvested it back into the farm. I mean, in 1978, they had a banner year he reinvested every nickel. They were non-smokers, non-drinkers, hadn't missed a day at church in, in 25 years. And I stood shoulder to shoulder with my mom and dad, my brother and sister, all of our neighbors, all of our competitors, everybody that was there to celebrate our failure. And they auctioned everything off right down to my mother's car in her house. And we literally crawled away. And I'm not trying to build up a rags to riches story. I personally believe that through that devastation, God had something else in mind for us. And without that, and some of us, I like to say, some of it's, it takes a bigger hint than others. And this was a two by four. And it really <laughs> thumped us. I hard. understand those two by fours. <laughs> and it was, I mean, it was a hard thump, but it gave us an opportunity to pause and to say, what are we doing? What was amazing to us was that in the last hundred years, the nutritional level in vegetables, and this is a fact, this isn't just my opinion, from 1920 to 2020, the nutritional level in vegetables has gone down 50 to 80%, and it's continuing to go down. Why is it with all the knowledge and the technology and the brilliance we have in this world that the nutritional level in vegetables could go down 50 to 80 percent in a hundred year period. And if you've got that number in mind, you can picture that graph in 1920 and going down 50 to 80 percent that, during that same time period, a 3,000 percent increase in kidney, liver, heart, cancer disease, attention deficit disorder, autism, childhood obesity, diabetes, the allergies, a 3,000% increase in a 100-year period while the nutritional levels are tanking. This is not a coincidence. Yes, We believe there's a direct correlation with the way that we're farming and the health or the lack thereof of our nation. So when we started thinking about it, why is it that 100 years ago, nutritional levels were 50 to 80% higher? My dad always had a saying that the only thing we're trying to do is get as good as the growers were 100 years ago. And in a lot of cases, that's true. But we started looking back at agricultural books that are 100, 150 years old, 200 years old. And what they were doing uh, was really a true rotation. Farmers still rotate the crops. I don't fault the farmers today. They're in a model and they're stuck. And that says, keep your expenses as low as possible, produce as many tons per acre as possible, and you might stay in business. It's all built around yield, tons per acre. And that's what allows them to stay in business. So this is, this is the model that the farmers are dealt today. So I do not fault the farmers. Their rotation today is between corn, wheat, and beans. Where they had the corn last year, they put the beans this year, and then they rotate. The old days, going back 100 years, or going back even further, uh, 100 acres was a large farm because that's about what a family could take care of. A third of it was in pasture. A third of it was in cover crops to take care and feed the animals in the winter. And a third of it was in production to take to market. And there was a rotation. You can go back to biblical times. Harvest fruit for six years on the seventh year, let the fruit fall to the ground. What were they doing? They were resting it. They were composting. Guess what? They had a great harvest in year eight. And so trying to go back and look at those lessons that had been lost or forgotten and really allowing that land to rest. It's, it's mind boggling to us. It's our personal belief 
the God design a system that's far more superior than anything we can fake out chemically or synthetically. Yeah. It's about working in harmony with nature rather than trying to outsmart it. You know, Randy, we talk about jokingly sometimes, I think, hey, I need some vitamin D. I'm going to go get some sunshine. Yeah. Maybe you've heard it. Maybe you've said it. Maybe you heard your parents say it. You don't didn't really know exactly what it meant, but our body is a receptacle for vitamin D through the sunshine. What's really cool is that when we find out what the deficiencies are in the soil, and we've put a lab in on the farm where we can test to find out. It's just like if you go get blood work drawn, high in iron, low in iron, high in calcium, get an entire printout of the minerals in the soil, just like in our bodies. Hmm. Once we find out what those deficiencies are, then we're planting crop specific. Different types of crops will harvest different types of energy from the sun. God had the plan all laid out and we screwed it up. So, once we know and identify those deficiencies, it may be clover, alfalfa, buckwheat, rye, vetch, barley, sedan grass, sunflower. We have a 15 species planting out of those 400 acres, 200 acres. It's an unprecedented commitment to harvesting the sun's energy. 200 acres is committed to cover crops of harvesting that energy from the sun. We used to think that when we planted the rows of food that we wanted to consume and grow, that in between had to be all weed free and clean. Guess what? We're planting cover crops in between those rows. So here you are harvesting that energy. It's going down, it's feeding the biology, putting the food into a form that the plant can pick it up. And lo and behold, the nutritional value in the vegetables is 150 to 300 times higher than the USDA average. It works. It's about working in harmony with nature rather than trying to outsmart it. That is brilliant. And that's the genius of what you all are doing at Farmer Jones Farm and at the Chef's Garden. Farmer Jones, that is remarkable beyond. And it is all about the soil, though, isn't it? Isn't it all about the soil? And it is so difficult to find, let's call it untainted soil anymore in this country or perhaps even around the globe. Is, is that true? It is true. Yet I think, I believe agriculture, if you look at how many times that the Bible refers to farming, uh, there's a unique closeness to farming and tending the land and, and that relationship with God. The soil can be tainted. But the good news is, is that the soil can be purified and it can be revived. And I don't need to spell out those implications biblically, but with a farmer, we feel like we have a new chance every year. Um, we're kind of like the Cleveland Browns, maybe next year. <laughs> but uh, but right. there's hope. The soil can be cleaned up and you can get rid of those chemicals and it, it, it helps with cover crops. Cover crops really cure a multitude of sins, if you will. It holds the soil in place. There's a great uh, documentary out there that I would encourage all the listeners to watch. It, it goes back all the way to the Dust Bowl. Part of the problem there was man-made, self-induced, no cover crops to hold that soil in place. So you have wind erosion, you have water erosion, you're losing, we're losing unprecedented amounts of topsoil because we're not holding it in place. We can also do a lot to be able to help secure our water um, because we're, the fresh water is one of those commodities. You know, we see mankind in wars over oil today. Isn't it a scary thought to think about the fact that if you think about what you might do to have drinking water for your family, Right. Um, that's a scary thought. We have to preserve that fresh water. In the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes is 21% of all fresh water in the world. And so it's really imperative that, that we do everything we can um, to preserve that water supply throughout the world. But the cover crops will harvest the sun's energy 
It'll prevent the wind erosion, prevent the water erosion. It'll preserve the water in the soil so we don't dry out. So there's a lot of things that the cover crops can do to, to help us. They're there to be able to enrich the soil, to feed the biology. There's more life below the earth's surface than above. When we use chemical to control weeds, and again, you can go back to the model that the farmers are working under, reduce the costs. You can, you can, you know, we hear of farmers cultivating their land. That means to eradicate the weeds. Well, traditionally you would go through after you planted the crops and you would cultivate and eradicate the weeds mechanically. No chemical, but you mechanically eradicated those weeds. Well, the pharmaceutical or the chemical companies said, gee, let's help the, help the farmers. We can do that by reducing their cost because when they plant it, they spray it and it kills everything other than the genetically modified seed that's been genetically modified to withstand the chemical. They told us when it hit the earth's surface that it dissipated. It wasn't true. We know that now. It kills the biology in the soil. So you put synthetic fertilizers on the soil. The biology is not there to break it down into, the form, into a form that the plant can take it up. So consequently, the nutritional levels go down. Because it's not breaking down into a form that the plant can pick it up, when you get a heavy rain, it's running off. It's going into the creeks. It's going into the rivers. It's going into the lakes. That's why we have algal bloom problems in the Great Lakes. You look at the western region where it's the most shallow. The algal bloom problems there, they even had to stop uh, pumping water out of the lake because here we are with fresh water and there's so much algal bloom that they couldn't pump the water. Um, so the the cover crops are really a foundation for regenerative agriculture. If you think about that, you're planting those crops, holding the soil in place, you're purifying the water, you're holding the water in the soil instead of letting it run off, and you're feeding the biology that can break the food down into a form that the plant can pick it up and to build nutrition, nutritional density, and life sustaining substances in those plants that when we eat, you are what you eat. You are what the plant eats. You are what the soil eats. Wow. That's and so I'm, I'm working on my internal soil. And so Dr. LaFay and I just did an episode a couple of weeks ago on our microbiome. And Dr. LaFay said that that is the, really the soil of our system. And if that's not healthy, it's not able to break down the food and absorb the nutrients and convert all of that into a usable form that fuels everything from our cholesterol backbone, our hormone making, our liver function, our bones. So you're describing the same, the same thing, really. And so your farming, it's called regenerative farming. Is that something that you termed or is that what? you subscribe to? It's a philosophy that we subscribe to. We've not invented anything. We're not geniuses. You alluded to us being genius about what we're doing. We, we don't deserve any of that credit. We're reading, we're trying to understand. We know that we're making mistakes, but we're continually on a paradigm to tr constantly improve. And we think we're on the right track. Um, Wonderful. You are on the right track. And so I, I think it's genius because I'm a city girl who moved out to a more rural area. So, so uh, indulge me here, Farmer Jones, <laughs> it's, it's genius to this recovering city girl. And, and second, there's a, a genius in your courage, if you will, because you are doing something, you and your family, your, your staff, all that you have given credit to, and certainly it's a, a team effort and a uh, intergenerational effort as well. You are doing something though, that is running counter to a narrative, a, a mainstream course of action, that which is prescribed, that which most everyone jumps on board and does. And so the Life by Randy community and how I work through uh, the cancer, the stage four cancer that I had was running counter to a mainstream Western medicine model narrative. And so I honor that way of thinking. And it takes a, a certain personality to stand in that 
it takes some courage, right? It takes hearing the voice of God and knowing that you know that this is the right way to do it and walking in that. And so I think that that's what you're doing at your farm. Well, I think that's very true. So how did you and your staff get the courage to do this or the thoughts to do it? I think that there was a, a story about a chef that you all had met many, many years ago that put you on the trajectory that you're now in and thriving at and becoming this, the chef's garden and providing fabulously nutrient rich vegetables to chefs around the world. Well, my dad's answer would be that we have to continue to make mistakes at a faster rate than the competition. <laughs> you could also say, and we do mistakes well, and, and you darn well better learn from them. But um, I think through desperation, mm. farming, agriculture was in our DNA. The entire farm was auctioned off. Mom's car, the home, the farm. We moved into six acres and an old farmhouse, which also went up for sale. Wow. Great side story to that. We won't get into it today, but we sent our preacher on our behalf to bid for us at the auction, at the courthouse steps. And by the grace of God, we ended up with that six acres back that we really needed to start over. It was $52,000 for six acres and a house. So you can imagine that it wasn't much. We had buckets on the inside of the house oh. to catch the leaks. And depending on which way the wind blew, you'd move the buckets around. We begged a neighbor to rent us 50 acres. We told them we might not make it through the first year, but if we did, we'd give them double the rent. And we did without a lot of things, but we got the rent paid and we continued to rent from that family uh, and have a great relationship with them. But we started back at farmer's markets because it was instant cash. We could put something in the ground and within 30 days, you could have greens and lettuce and radishes and you could take them to the market and turn it into dollars. So many side stories. The vehicles we were using to go to the farmer's markets should not have even been perhaps on the road. They were worn out. Nobody would bid on them at the sheriff's sale. And so we inherited them and patched them up enough to go to farmer's markets. We knew nothing about the culinary world other than the fact that if our preacher was short-winded that day and we got out before the Baptists, we would get, the line wasn't too long at Ramada Inn, and we would go to the Ramada Inn for a top sirloin steak for oh. $6.95 and all you could eat salad bar. And we were living high on the hog to get to go to the Ramada Inn, but we knew nothing about the culinary world. So we're at the farmer's market and this woman comes up in a chef's jacket. She had trained in Europe and she said, you know, if you guys would grow for the quality, use varieties for the flavor rather than the tons per acre, if you would try and do this chemical free, I think that there would be enough chefs that would support you. We were so desperate for a way to be able to survive in agriculture we latched around both of her ankles and we wouldn't let go. And we said, teach us. <laughs> and we finished that season. We called her and we said, she was actually an executive chef for a brokerage firm in downtown Cleveland. She had kind of a nice situation when they had investors in, she would cook for them. When there wasn't, she would study and learn and look for sources. And so she had some free time and we said, we'd like to buy an hour of your time and come in this winter and sit down and talk with you. Well, we couldn't afford her hour of time. And fortunately she did not charge us for it, but she was so excited that somebody was listening. And when we went in, it was this big, long conference table. As you might imagine, as an attorney, it was kind of intimidating and daunting, but that table, and I'm sure it was 26 feet long in a beautiful room, that table was covered with books where she had marked them with a page on something she thought was of interest. We spent several hours there that Saturday and we came back and my dad in particular, we went to work and we started growing vegetables for chefs. And I started going and knocking on doors 
and talking to chefs and seeing if they would be interested. And they said yes. And Iris introduced us to another chef and then another chef and then another chef. And we ended up meeting uh, of the chef at the Ritz Carlton in Cleveland. And we enjoyed a great relationship with him. He did a lot to help us, took us under his wing as well. And about five years into that relationship, he called and said, Farmer, I got some bad news for you. They're transferring me to a new property. We're opening a Ritz Carlton uh, in Phoenix. Like him, we thought it would be a postcard and a Christmas card once a year. And that was the end of that enjoyable relationship with chef and farmer. About three months after he got out there, he said, farmer, he called me up. He says, I never thought I'd be making this phone call. Being this much closer to California, I figured I would have no problem getting the ingredients that I needed. But you guys really spoiled me when I was in Cleveland. You need to figure out how to get them to me in Phoenix. And we thought, what, you, what are you talking about? So we put, put an order together and we put it in some boxes and we put it on a Greyhound bus. Well, it arrived about eight days later and it was dripping out the bottom and he's like, farmer, what are you doing? <laughs> You can't put it on Greyhound. You got to put it on FedEx. So we shipped it again, and they had done what they call in the culinary world a soft opening. They opened, but they didn't really try and promote business. Well, they're now about six months in. They're, they've done their soft opening. They're ready to do a big shindig. They invite the mayor of Phoenix in. They invite all the dignitaries. They flew in about 10 executive chefs from other Ritz Carlton's, Ritz Laguna Niguel, Ritz Naples, Ritz DC, Ritz Atlanta, Ritz Buckhead, flew all these executive chefs in to make sure when they did this big event that they really did it in true Ritz Carlton fashion. And so we shipped in a huge order. Of course, all of our boxes were unmarked and we had an unlisted phone number and, uh, all these chefs see this product and they're like, where are you getting this stuff? And the chef's like, no, 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 no. You get your own. This is my guy. <laughs> they went out and imbibed a little bit after the event and the chef ponied up the phone numbers. And so the next thing you know, the Ritz Naples, Ritz Laguna Niguel, Ritz Atlanta, all over were calling and we were shipping to them. And it's just been, you know, over the last 40 years of working direct with chefs and shipping product to them. And that, that started our journey. So it's really been 35 years since then that we've been focused on that. Of course, COVID, of course, COVID turned our world upside down again. God said, you got another direction for you. And the farm market, uh, we hadn't done any retail in 40 years. But the farm, the market was just dried up because the restaurants were closed and they were struggling too. The community was looking for fresh food, safe food. We opened an open air market on the corner, on the, six, on the original six acres and made the product available to the community. And in the same time, we launched a nationwide home delivery where people could go online and order product that we could ship to them because we were afraid to go in grocery stores and we wanted safe product where they knew that there was a conscientious family attempting to grow the healthiest vegetables possible and that they were safe. And so that's what we did. We did the farm to family that the government started. We were doing anything we could to get to first base, to survive. The goal became survival during COVID to be able to hang on and to keep our farm family together. It was so imperative. The single greatest asset on our farm is not greenhouses, it's not land, it's not tractors, it's not equipment, it's people. Mm -hmm. People are what make this farm work. There's a thousand years collectively of experience at the chef's garden on the chef's garden team. And that's really, really important to us. And so we wanted to weather that storm, keep the farm going. You don't furlough a farm. It's kind of like a relationship. You don't walk out and then come back two years and say, hi, honey, I'm home. And so, you know, the farm, she, there's a, there's a connection between a farmer and the land. 
And we just didn't think that we could close down and then reopen when things came back. We had to keep our team together, our family together and keep our farm. And so, so we started the, the farm market. We launched the, um, the online in the, and the three most important things that chefs told us over the last 40 years was flavor was most important. Flavor was second most important. Flavor was third most important. <laughs> and we really in order. <laughs> yeah. And we really worked hard to achieve the best flavor possible. And that occurs through balance in the soil. Not genetic modification, not magic, not voodoo, really finding balance in the soil. And my dad had a hypothesis that as we worked towards achieving better flavor, he suspected that we were possibly bringing the nutritional value up too. He said, we have to figure out the cause and effect of what we're doing. What's working well, what's not working well, how can we improve? Constant improvement. So we invested more money than we had ever invested in anything else, not land, not tractors, not greenhouses, in research equipment. And we put a lab in right on the farm to be able to test the soil, to test the biology, to understand what the biology, what the life of the biology was in the soil, to get a better understanding. And then, of course, you know, Dr. Amy, we hired Dr. Amy away from the Mayo Clinic, moved her and her family here and got her involved. And we really believe that the future is health and wellness yes. for us to be able to provide the healthiest, most nutritious, sexiest vegetables humanly possible. And that's our goal is to be able to provide those to anybody that wants them anywhere in the country. I love that. Then you have a market that my mother and I, my husband have gone to on Saturdays in our neck of the woods, which we absolutely love. Then you have the chef's garden, which, and then you have the culinary vegetable Institute. And, and that is for, I think that's a state of the art facility that globally is known and chefs from all over the world can come and learn in an experiential environment. That's exactly right. And the Culinary Vegetable Institute was started about 22 years ago as a place for our chefs to come. We pivoted during COVID for that. You can do Airbnb. Guests can come and stay at the Culinary Vegetable Institute and get a farm experience at the Culinary Vegetable Institute. So, you know, you have to be nimble on your feet and keep moving. It, right. You have to be resilient, stay hopeful, stay positive. And it's that when one door closes, a window opens or something like that. Exactly. Um, I've never been good at, at saying, so I get the general gist of it. But yes, the COVID, sure, if you're predominantly uh, serving the restaurant market globally, and that pretty much shuts down overnight, <laughs> that possibly could have taken you all down. But now what you did, you and your team, you turn that around, you had to quickly pivot. And now so many others can enjoy these vegetables and they don't have to be a restaurateur or top chef. That's exactly right. And, you know, again, I always am hesitant. I always have pride cometh before a fall mm -hmm. in my mind. And we didn't do anything. Again, God had a plan. But, you know, the difference between when my dad lost the farm in the early 80s and this time, it's, I was so, I had so much fear in my heart that this was deja vu. And I visualized that here we were, we had worked our tails off for 30 years. And now at the end of my dad's life, we're going to lose the farm again. And one of the first things that we did, so many chefs miss birthdays. Um, first baseball games, holidays, because they're serving their customers in their places of business. And lo and behold, in the middle of COVID, those people got to be together and spend time and they were eating together again at the table. And I think maybe we were praying more, but yeah. we also, 
ironically, one of the unsuspected consequences and a silver lining was there were more gardens planted during COVID than in any time in the history of the United States, even going back to the Victory Gardens during the war. And you know, kids emulate their parents. The parents are planting the garden. Guess what? Joey wants to come help. Well, he's a whole lot more excited about tasting a carrot that he helped grow. I hope that we have started a whole new generation of gardeners out there. And how exciting is that? that so, is. You know, I think that it was, but, but here's the difference. About six weeks or eight weeks in, I felt like I had just been running on adrenaline, working frantically to figure out how we were going to survive this. And so was everybody else on the farm. It was like our team went to battle together. But I started reading because one of the things we did was when those chefs were at home, we sent out about 300 boxes around the country to chefs and said, we're so sorry that you're not at work. We understand that you're at home with your family, getting to cook with your family. We're sending a box in hopes that it will help you stay healthy and you can cook together with your family. And by the way, we're launching a, no, we have no budget, but we're launching a overnight um, national home delivery to everyone, everybody in the country. And we'd love for you to post some pictures of what you do and link back to the farm. And so about six or eight weeks into this, I'm looking down through Facebook and I'm seeing all of these chefs posting and linking back to the farm. And it was very humbling. I, uh, I just wept because I knew that the difference in when my dad lost the farm and he was selling to grocery stores, there was a safety net and it was the culinary community. And they said, not on our watch. And it's humbling to know that and it's a good reminder that we don't ever do anything on our own. Certainly God had our back, but there was a culinary community that was there and it helped us survive a really, really rough patch for everybody in the world. And um, we're here to talk about it. And now we're launched off on a new path of health and wellness and it's very exciting. Um, the way it works is we put together, it's basically a walk through the garden in any given day. And we put together offerings that are available online and people can place an order. We go and harvest those. We bring them in, we wash them, we clean them, we pack them and we ship them out and they arrive on people's front porches. Um, it's been pretty amazing. And ironically, the farm where the farm market where you stood two weeks ago, I had not set foot on that farm in 40 years. Um, that's the farm that we lost 40 years ago. In the middle of COVID, the neighboring farmer says, I'm ready to retire. Do you want to buy the farm back? And through it wasn't a great time, but we we were able to pull that off. I was hopeful my dad was going to get to walk that farm with us again. He knew that it was happening. He knew that we got it back. Um, we lost him about four months before, so he didn't get to. It was certainly a shameful time for him. He felt he failed the family, but he knew that we got the farm back. So my brother and I went on our maiden voyage after it was officially in our name. And we went up in a loft and we found six brand new, unused, 40-year-old Bob Jones Farms boxes that had been there for 40 years. We went a little further back and there were four or five baskets that said Charles Nichols Farm, which was the man that my father went to work for at 14 years old. So they were just waiting for us to return. So it was really, really if you ever needed a name for a farm, it would be Full Circle Farms. <laughs> <laughs> and you reap what you sow, how God has so richly blessed you. You could see your heart for humanity. You could see your heart for your God. 
And you could see your heart certainly for the community and the land, Farmer Jones. And we do, things do come full circle and we do reap what we sow. And I'm so glad that you are so richly blessed from all of it. And, and your family is too. But there were lots of, lots of tough times. Oh, and yeah. resilience is the key in this life, isn't it? to be resilient and to really know that when these challenges, trials, traumas enter our lives, they're there to teach us if we have the open, loving, and curious attitude of what is this here to teach me and how how is this here to enhance my life? Because certainly from your story, which is so fabulously inspiring, and a lot of grit in the story, though, that you had to keep staying true and not falter and not waver and have a lot of courage to bring this into fruition. And so, yes, there is certainly the divine plan in our lives. There is the divine of all. And there is, though, a corresponding part on, uh, of, of ours that we play. Because you had to keep standing strong in the storms. You had to overcome your childhood trauma of seeing everything auctioned off down to your mother's car. I mean, I, that's very, very impactful, just like many of the people who grew up during the Great Depression. M both my parents are living. They were born in 1931, the lowest birth rate year. And I know what the depression is about. And I know about not being wasteful because I'm a child of depression babies. And so those lessons stay with us forever. And just like sometimes trauma can stay with us, but you have turned this around, you and your family, to come so full circle. And to your point about gardening, taking off, I see this just like I see functional medicine and energy medicine as the next frontier that we are currently starting to walk into. Farmer Jones, you are right in that sweet spot of soil, of farming, of good food, non-GMO, non-chemical, great nutrition, wholesome living, you're right in that sweet spot and you are poised for more greatness, I think, than you could ever have dreamt. Or maybe you do have big dreams and you're just not telling us, but truly, this is this is the future. This is a future of food. And I see that we're going to be going to these smaller communities. I felt a call out of Cleveland. I'm a Clevelander. And if you know anything about Clevelanders, we love Cleveland. And while I still love it, I felt called out to a more rural place to connect in a smaller community, even though I had a great community in the Cleveland area. And I grew up there and I've got some friends going back to uh, kindergarten, actually. So I do, did enjoy great community there, but this is a different kind of community out in the 419 area code. And this farming, uh, wholesome way of living and way of being is just to slow down more, to pay attention more to community, to sit and pray over that meal, enjoy that meal, understand what it's like to take in the nutrients that are so lovingly grown and cared for by a farm like yours. To know the farmer is such a blessing. And I see these kind of microcosms popping up all over the globe, actually. We are feeling a call as humanity to that place and space. And specifically COVID did that. I think that's another blessing of COVID is it took humanity in a timeout, mm -hmm. right? And you had to really kind of pivot to still stay strong and viable and you did it to even greater success. How wonderful. I think that's absolutely true. We've been blessed way beyond what we deserve. We also feel some moral and ethical obligation to be able to do everything we can to be able to share healthy food with folks and make that available and spread the love. Yes, absolutely. Spread the love. You grow it in love, you care for it in love, and you certainly spread the love. What an honor it has been to talk to you. I know I have been so moved by our conversation, and I know that as the conversation ripples out, 
into the universe that it is going to continue to spread the love to educate and continue to inspire. Thank you for this wonderful, powerful conversation, Farmer Jones, and for your precious time spent with me and us today. It's been a pure delight. Thank you for having me on, Randy. You're welcome. And I hope you come on again. Absolutely. Anytime. Thank Thank you. Eat your veggies. I do. Five to eight servings a day, Dr. LaFay says. (laughs) And eat the veggies from Farmer Jones Farm. Links below. Until next time, thank you. Thank you so much.